Hello, everyone. How is everybody doing? Hello, Dr. Doing? Okay. Good, good, good. How are you doing? Good, good. 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 good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, everyone. But we are going to start here uh, shortly. We're still allowing people in and we are transmitting on YouTube as well. But there are a lot of uh, missing faces that are showing up tonight. <laughs> and I probably know why. Uh, so, uh, but it's great. Uh, it's great to see everybody on here. Uh, I see that, Kwame. All right, everyone. So uh, tonight, there's going to be a very interesting discussion. And we are starting off our Cybersecurity Month, uh, the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We are starting ours tonight. So with that, we will be uh, going into what we did last year for Cybersecurity uh, Awareness Month. We give some scholarships. Uh, to our cyber chat attendees. So we are going to do that uh, tonight as well. Now we are going to spread it. Uh, we're initially going to give 10, uh, eight. We are going to give 10. Uh, we want to spread it over the whole month of October. So starting uh, from tonight, we will be giving at least, you know, uh, three and then you know, spread it out anyhow uh, we want to do it based on whatever criteria that we come up with, right? So the criteria is not pre-planned. Uh, we just... The criteria we are going to announce uh, midway or at the end of the presentation. Uh, that way it is fair and free to uh, everyone. There are no drag deals behind the scenes. Uh, everybody is equal on here. So if you win, you know you won, you won on your own merits. And there were no like special favors or any drag deals. All right. So uh, good evening once again. We are starting off your show. We are just doing some admin stuff and then we will begin. Please. You're muted. Yes. All right, so I think we are good to go. Yeah, so we we started off with almost like 90, 98 there about right uh so which is good and we still have folks coming in so uh before we begin let's make sure we are recording this um disable all right welcome everyone welcome to cyber chat we do this every friday night 7 p.m eastern and we appreciate your time and your support and always you know showing up at this time of the week that you can you know be uh, doing other things, you know, preparing for the weekend, but you choose to be here to share knowledge with the family. So I'm Dr. Emmanuel Edu, and today's discussion, we will be looking at cybersecurity incident response. And I know a lot of people are very interested in incident response. So that is why uh, we started off mostly, you know, we will start off with at least uh, a good, maybe 50, and then people will be uh, trickling in as we are moving along. But today we started off with almost like 100 before it was seven which was good so that shows interest or maybe some other interests right so uh, i'm dr emmanuel i do if you are new to the family uh, i'm a former united states army captain i'm the ceo of Erasmus inc we are a qsa company cyber security consulting firm based out of new york and i'm also the founder of Erasmus academy a cyber security training institute also based out of new york and uh, this program is brought to you by Erasmus academy so with that, we are going to move on into the topic for tonight. So tonight, uh, we will be looking at cyber news and we will jump into, and we have internship slash workshop coming up uh, 
part of which is going to be uh, part of the, the, the scholarship that we are going to give. Uh, we are starting this off in October 21st, and then we are starting a new PCI class uh, for expert and specialist also in October 16th. And with our entry level course, you can start at any time, right? So we will be discussing cybersecurity incident response. Uh, we will first look at the case study and dive a, a bit deep into the case study. And we will look at the definition and also jump into uh, the steps in incident response. And uh, I think for incident response tonight, we cannot treat the whole entire uh, subject. So we are going to maybe touch a little bit on it next week, looking at the career perspective when it comes to incident response. And I think uh, we'll be able to wrap up with the topic of incident response, hopefully next week. Right, so let's get started. Uh, for cyber news, we are just going to discuss briefly uh, our October Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So it's a National Cybersecurity Awareness Month for the United States and also around the world. Uh, everybody within the cyberspace, all countries have come to accept that October is a Cybersecurity Month. And uh, I think they chose it uh, for a reason, right? Uh, guess what? Dr. Edu was also born in October. So uh, maybe that is why I, I love everything Cybersecurity and uh, I'm well vested in cybersecurity. So all October bonds on here. Uh, maybe you are a cybersecurity uh, October born as well, right? So, and as part of our cybersecurity awareness, creating awareness about cybersecurity, uh, what we can do as Arrhythmus family is to give scholarships to uh, the Arrhythmus community, right? And help push. Yeah, October born. We are here. Yeah, help push uh, the cybersecurity agenda, right? So. Uh, just to pick, you know, anybody's brain, uh, why October? And anybody has any idea why uh, October was picked for Cyber Security Month around the world? Uh, you can raise your virtual hand. So please, you raise your virtual hand and we'll give you the floor to speak. So if anybody has any insight scoop, why October was chosen as a Cyber Security Month. And mostly what do we do uh, for Cyber Security Awareness Month? Uh, for the United States, mm, Sometimes I think for the past maybe a year or two, it's been a bit louder, but before then it was a bit quiet when it comes to Cyber Security Month. Uh, anybody aware of the reason for uh, choosing October as a Cyber Security Month? Virtual hands. Okay, Ucheba, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, speaking, uh, I I wasn't able to hear. Okay. October was designed as a National Cyber Awareness Month in the United States. The decision to choose October for this initiative was made to raise awareness about cyber security and promote safe online practices ahead of the holidays season. When cyber threat often increase additionally the October South as a reminder for individuals and organizations to enhance their digital security measures as they prepare for the upcoming year. All right, thank you. Uh, and I I saw some some hands were also raised. Uh, Troy, what well, no, I think Troy is trying to log in. So Ucheba and who else? Uh, Doc, go ahead. Yes, I was going to say um, Black Friday and Cyber Monday after the um, Thanksgiving holiday, all the shopping that begins for Christmas and, and all the other um, religious holidays between November and January. Uh, Sydney, thank you. Okay, thank you for having me, Doctor. Um, you see, I I think uh, most companies uh, do close their books sometime in September, which marks the, uh, the end of their fiscal year. And uh, it's, it's a way of uh, educating companies and the general public to be proactive um, as regards that period, which uh, I think 
uh, most companies will probably be preparing to close their books and all that. And then the cyber uh, actors as well will be trying to take advantage of that period uh, where companies are struggling to close their book and probably start a new fiscal year. Okay, thank you. Uh, Julius. Yes, uh, so so uh, Dr. Drew, so this this whole uh, process started in 2004 uh, when mm -hmm. the, they created the uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. In, 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 that was specifically in October in 2004. So they, they created this this initiative to 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 sensitize people about cybersecurity, you know, and and how people can protect their systems and all of that. So it was a movement that started in two thousand and four in October. Okay, thank you. The kids, uh, Vincent. Um, you all, you guys also have to remember there's a lot of transactions going on during that time. So cybersecurity is a big thing because you can get hacked, think about it. Some people do 6,000 plus transactions, six, uh, correction, 6 million plus transactions during that time. So that's probably a big reason why they started doing cybersecurity in October because like, it's, like you guys said, some of the other people said, uh, you got the holidays coming up where people are getting ready to start buying, doing all their shopping and all that stuff. Great, great, great insight, Vincent. Uh, Idris, Oh, Idris, hopefully I got your name right. Uh, please, we can barely hear you. Uh, if you, okay. you get closer to your mic. Yeah. I am, I am now. Yes. Okay, I'm saying that because of what happened during the 9 11 year in the United States and, and what is coming next, like all the data is coming, so there's a lot of foundation. There's going on at what people see. And I think it's because 9 11, since the technology is going on, it is because there's a lot of cyber attack now during the early days. And so I just choose your portfolio and cyber weapons. Okay, thank you. And I think we will take one last person in the list. Uh, Prince? Well, um, as far as I'm concerned, I think it was the president of the United States and the Congress that actually declared the month of October to be the Cybersecurity Awareness Month. President of Congress. Okay, thank you. Uh, and okay, one more after Prince, because Prince was brief. Uh, Leonard. Um, the last person just said it. I wanted to just add a joiner. Mm -hmm. There's an agreement between the U.S. President and the Congress to raise an awareness, you know, for the entire populace as, as well as the public and private sector on cybersecurity. Thank you. So uh, anybody else has, okay, I know there are some hands up. Uh, I'll probably start from the bottom now. Kofi, go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Edu, I think it, it was a collaborative effort between the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the mm -hmm. National Cyber Security Alliance that came together to uh, name this uh, month and, and particular time for safeguarding uh, information online due to cyber crime. Okay, and uh, maybe for the rest of the hands that are up, so uh, what really do you think is the goal behind Cyber Security Awareness Month? And like, why do we even need Cybersecurity Awareness Month? Not maybe DevOps Awareness Month or any other, you know, uh, part of uh, uh, IT for the like remaining hands that are up. Uh, I'll go with uh, Derek and then uh, if you might. Go ahead, Derek. Uh, it was dedicated as a month to Cybersecurity Awareness Organization and individuals have the opportunity to focus on improving their digital hygiene, uh, learning about em uh, emerging threats and taking steps to protect themselves and their data online. Um, good evening. Um, yeah, okay. go ahead. I'll, yeah, I would say that um, the reason why it was, uh, really? October okay. was chosen is because um, it measures needed to be put in place to protect uh, Americans with the growing use of the internet at that time. And um, of course, before 
policies are set up, there's, there's usually incidents of, um, you know, crimes on the internet that have happened before. So the Department of Homeland Security and the National Cyber Security Alliance set this up, of course, with the backing of the of the US government to, to, to keep the citizens safe from cyber crimes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I think we'll probably choose one last one and we'll move on. Uh, who didn't? Joel. Okay, Doctor. Um, um, this is um, why um, um, why um, Cybersecurity Awareness Month is important. And I believe um, one, education and awareness. Many people are uh, unaware of the various cyber threats and risks you know, they face online. And the Cybersecurity Awareness Month provides a platform to you know, educate individuals, businesses, and organizations about the latest cyber threats, best practices, and how to you know, protect themselves and um, their information. Also prevention, you know, awareness campaign can help individuals and organizations to prevent cyber attacks, you know, by promoting good and um, cyber security hygiene. We also like, there's another point that I can raise, you know, promoting um, responsible behavior and um, a couple of, you know, reasons. These are why, this, these are some of the reasons why um, cyber security awareness um, month is very important. Okay, okay. Uh, Terry, just picking up. Um, all right, right, Terry. Uh, yeah, good evening, all. Uh, I think for me, it highlights the importance of cybersecurity you know, just, just before the holiday shopping season begins. You know, the increase in online shopping and online financial <laughs> transaction during the holiday season is, is kind of huge at this time of the year. So uh, from this time up down to January, so I think that's one of the uh, main reasons why uh, this is choosing. Okay, uh, great. Uh, great point, great point. Uh, so far, everybody's making great point. Uh, Pabina, please go ahead. Yeah. Um as much as everyone is saying, it's the same thing, just to draw, um, if, oh, geez, I'm sorry. It's a day set aside um, for awareness of cyber security, so that people, okay. uh, there are a lot of people. Oh, please go ahead. Um, I'm sorry, so sorry. So there are a lot of people who are not, who. Who, who don't know the meaning of cybersecurity and they are not aware of it. So it was set up by the United States uh, President and the Congress. They all agree that the public sector and the private sectors should be aware um, about cyber security. I mean, so that they'll be able to protect their assets. Each organization should be able to protect their assets and be aware of it, about the cyber crime going on in the space. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, lastly, we will have uh, Mohammed, and then uh, Awini will go. Go ahead, Mohammed. Yeah, I think the goal is uh, overall goals is uh, to educate uh, the cybersecurity community about and make them awareness about you know the threats that exist uh, in the world especially in the United States. Uh, and the reason why it's celebrated is, first, it's almost uh, the end of the year. And a lot of people kind of basically lack their uh, attention and focus on, you know, you know, it's preparing holidays. And, and that's what a lot of criminals uh, come into and play when your guards are down. And also, uh, because of the holiday, there's a lot of transactions happening on through the uh, online, and that's where uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, dark webs and you know inside you know threats happens, uh, and a lot of credit card information got stolen. So they want to make it uh, October just to uh, educate them about you know what's coming you know ahead of them. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, are we going to go ahead? Okay, so it was a man prepared for um, 
digital awareness within the environment companies operate in, the essence of it is to uh, let people anticipate the threats and challenges that will come in the future, and then to protect consumers, to be aware of the how to be safe online, and then to let institutions that are directly involved to collaborate with each other to increase the level of awareness and bring education to the consumer of cyber technology in order to be able to stay safe in every transaction that they are carrying out. So it is, it is a man chosen to actually educate and increase uh, awareness about threat landscape within the public and about uh, fostering a safer digital environment for everyone so that we can all be safe online. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Awini. Uh, Joseph and uh, Akwesi will go. I think like Julius also wants to make another point. But Joseph and Akwesi, uh, Joseph can go first, and then uh, Akwesi will go. Yeah, I just wanted to say that one of the reasons why the awareness is very important is because humans are the weakest link in any security system. And uh, we, we, human beings, are, no matter how secure a system is, if you don't sensitize the people, if you don't create awareness, they could easily, you know, compromise everything you put in place by simply clicking on a phishing email or using an old password or accessing the network without the VPN in an uncontrolled environment. So I think the awareness, the October awareness is just to, it's targeted at humans to make sure they follow the adequate uh, software security and all the protocols put in place to protect them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Akwesi, go ahead. All right. Um, I would say, um, while I'm speaking from the Australian point of view, in Australia, 2009, October, the government um, accepted that um, there's going to be a cyber security awareness month, just as in the US. Um, and it, it was probably because um, 2 million Australians are probably gullible to online um, cyber attacks, mostly on their credit cards or whatever they do on the shopping online when the season, um, should I say, festivities are coming, you know, Christmas is coming, whatever they do, the shopping, whatever they do, they leave their computers and they don't attack, they don't, they don't tend to attend to it. So cyber criminals, should I say, they attend to or they attack their cars and then they use their cars for whatever purpose that they need to use for. And the government actually chose October as an awareness month to educate. So constantly they are education on TV, adverts and everything in October. They keep playing it on TV so that people will be sensitized and then be aware of cyber threats. And um, companies also come together to educate the public. And then even in their company, you know, um, should I say, in offices, you see awareness going on concerning cyber security threats that are happening constantly, probably, you know, definitely to older Australians specifically, because the young ones know how to maneuver their way, but older Australians are more gullible to cyber threats than the younger ones. So we choose October as a cyber security awareness month in this country as well. So that's my point of view I'd like to share. Okay, thank you, Akwesi. And I think, like, Julius, want to go again? Or if this is for yes. you? Yes, doctor, I just wanted to, to reiterate something. So, uh, as I said earlier, this is an initiative that started in 2004. And I wanted to point out that uh, it was initiated by the, 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 the U.S. government in collaboration with the, with the IT industry, you know, so to 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 help, uh, you know, uh, companies and, you know, in the, the companies and uh, different organizations to to uh, uh, cater for their for their uh, security uh, 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 postures, you know. So, so uh, it, it was it, it 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 was because of you know the evolution of technology. You know, prior to two thousand and four, you know, things were not as as after two thousand and four when technology, you know, had all the smartphones and all this stuff coming up. So the government of the U.S., you know, saw it, saw this this uh, as an, an opportunity to. To, to 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 partner with the the the, the IT industry to set up you know uh, uh, this uh, October month to to create awareness for for people to 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 like kind of it kind of you know getting people to know exactly how they can 
get themselves, you know, uh, protect their systems and all of that. So it it work. It is typically a, a U.S. Uh, initiative. All right, thank you, Gilos. Uh, point well made, and I appreciate everybody's inputs. So yes, of course, uh, what everybody said is right on the money. You know, like I'll say. Uh, so October, the reason for really choosing that uh, choosing October. Uh, it's partly because of the strategic uh, time within the year that October uh, falls within and then also, you know, everything else that we talked about. And uh, this is an initiative that was uh, championed by the United States and everybody else is like following suit, right? So, uh, and predominantly we are, we have Cybersecurity Awareness Month because uh, cybersecurity, right, uh, can make or make companies, even uh, individuals, but you know how many people are really aware of it. And then one also one aspect of it that the awareness man focuses on is cyber security career, right? Bringing a lot of people into the cyber security space. Uh, so if people know about it, then they will know about like career paths in cyber security and you know what are some of the ways that we can get into the cyber security industry because uh, for uh, around the world there's over like 3.5 on field cyber security jobs around the world in the united states last time i checked it was almost 700 uh, uh, or oh, 660,000 on field cyber security jobs right so uh the the demand or like the number of cyber security on field jobs keep growing from 2000 from 2020 it was around for 500,000 uh, on field cyber security jobs in the us Two years down the line, two and a half years down the line is almost 700,000. So the trend it looks like is going to keep increasing and we need to you know, generate more or we need to create more cybersecurity professionals to fill these roles. And the longer that takes, you know, uh, the better that is for attackers because they can easily attack companies and you know, individuals with no lines of defense or like uh, nobody to really hold them accountable. So everything that everybody you know said uh, is good, uh, and as every as we are all here, we should all be ambassadors of the Cyber Security Awareness Month. So if not for anything, uh, just invite friends and family, uh, people that you think might be interested in in Cyber Security to join Cyber Chats, to join other uh, Cyber Security uh, webinars and stuff out there, and then also spread the word, right? Spread the word, you know, talk to friends and family about Cyber Security and some of the ways that you can uh, use to protect yourself, right? So as part of this, uh, next week, although we will be still looking at incident response, uh, we will still take a look at, uh, we will take a look at how some of the techniques and some of the ways we can protect ourselves uh, personally, right? Not our companies personally. So on WhatsApp, on different apps that we have on our phone, uh, what are some of the tricks that we can use to protect ourselves against some of these attackers and scammers that are out there, right? And I think when we approach uh, cyber security from that perspective, we are able to catch everybody's attention because mostly people would like to know what is in this for me, right? So even for us, uh, Arrhythmus as a company, for the awareness training that we do for companies, uh, we first start off with how you will be able to protect yourself. So the you in there is the staff, right? So individually, we show you some of the tricks uh of how you'll be able to protect yourself and we also sometimes we demonstrate some of the attacks in real real life for you to see how simple that is uh so with that they pay more attention and they feel like you know they are well invested in this because they have something to lose or they have something to uh they have something to lose if they don't pay attention because attackers can easily attack them and uh, it is on them to make sure that uh they are you know, uh, keeping in touch with what is going on in terms of some of the tricks and tips that attackers are uh, using. So I appreciate everybody's uh, inputs. Everybody was right on the money. Uh, so we are going to jump into what we are, our discussion for tonight. So tonight we are going to be looking at cyber security incident response, right? And all of us might have encountered an incident at a point in time, uh, maybe on different scales or uh, on different levels for organizations when there is an incident uh it's a whole different ball game right uh, so an incident within an organization can uh kick them out of business so statistically for organizations that 
some small to medium organizations that will suffer a cyber incident, uh, 68% of them go out of business within six months, right? So, and even for big companies, uh, it is also going to be a huge problem. They lose a lot of money, lawsuits, uh, they lose goodwill, right? So, but the sad truth is every company is going to get breached. It's just a matter of when, right? Regardless of what you do in security, you are going to get breached in one way or the other. It's just a matter of when, right? So it's not whatever you are doing, you are not immune. You can pass all your audits. You can you know, buy the best security solution in place. You can do everything right, but there's nothing like zero security in, in cybersecurity or information security, right? And in the world in general, there's nothing like zero, like zero risks, not security, zero risks. There's nothing like zero risks. There's always going to be some leftover risks after you put in place all the controls. So because of that leftover risks, no matter how big or small, uh, attackers might be able to take advantage of it at a point in time based on the situation or the circumstance. Uh, so what is really going to help your company is how you respond to such an attack or such a response, uh, such an attack or such an incident. Right. So we are going to look at real time case study and everybody knows this company. Everybody on here has used this company uh, either to order foods or to get a ride. Right. So we are going to start with guess who? Uber. Now, uh, we can easily start jumping into incident response and do definitions and stuff. And that, that is that. But, you know, we it has to be something that we can all relate to. Right. Uh, to give us a better understanding of what incident response is all about. Right? And I, I bet anybody on here who has never sat in a cybersecurity class and, you know, you are really indifferent when it comes to cybersecurity, I think this is going to uh, pick your interest. Right? So we are going to look at a case study, uh, Uber, right? So incident response case study, uh, our company that we are looking at tonight is Uber. Now, what happened to Uber? Now, our guy that we have here on the right uh, Mr. Sullivan, he was the former CIO, I think his chief information uh, security officer and uh, with Uber, right? So he was the guy, uh, chief, chief security officer. So C CSO, CSO, we have CIO, chief information officer, or CISO, sometimes chief information security officer. So this guy was a chief security officer, which is almost the same level or almost the same as CISO, right? Uh, he got sentenced to three years probation for covering up an incident in Uber, right? So we are going to get into the details of his case and what he did. And then we are going to get into the technical aspect of the incident in question, right? So this happened this year, May 5th. Uh, by the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, North, North District of California, right? And information that we are presenting here was directly picked from the websites of the, uh, of the North uh, District of California's uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, right? So a former security officer of Uber sentenced to three years probation. So he didn't, I think for the lawyers or people with law background here, uh, three years of probation, I think he didn't, you are not going to give you probably some other things that they're going to have you do. And if you violate any of those, you can end up in jail. Uh, and he paid a fine of 50000 So what did he really do? He was a chief security officer in charge of everything, cyber security, information security, everything security within the company, right? Why is he in court for anything? I mean, the company got breached. So does it mean why is the CEO not in court? Because he's overall in charge of the company. Uh, he's overall in charge of everything, including the chief security officer, right? So let's get into the details of the case. Uh, so Mr. Joseph Sullivan was sentenced to three years, uh, three year term of probation in order to pay $50,000. Uh, and this was announced by the court whose website we got this information from, right? And uh, this was after uh, a jury found him guilt, uh, guilty of two felony counts uh, in October 2022. So his sentence was actually in 2023, but he was found guilty October 2022. And funny enough, it was in uh, 
cyber security, cyber security awareness crisis, uh, awareness month, right? So now let's move on. So Sullivan uh, 54 from Palo Alto, he previously served as, I mean, now he's no more the security officer uh, with Uber. And so proud to him joining Uber, Uber suffered a data breach in 2024 and uh, 2014. And uh, this data breach was being investigated by the Federal Trade uh, Commission, FTC. So when they started the investigation into this breach, right? So there was an incident uh, in 2014 where Uber, you know, was breached. So, and customer data was stolen and all that. So FTC, uh, which is responsible for anything that has to do with customer data privacy and customer data, uh, they are the ones who are going to take you on, right? So they were investigating this and this happened proud to Sullivan joining the company, right? So now because he was the chief security officer, he was in charge of, you know, uh, like collaborating with this agency to make sure that all the information that they needed, you know, uh, they are going to get the information that they needed. So, so uh, as part of the investigation, he he took the oath uh, to provide all the necessary information and to be truthful to the best of his abilities and knowledge. So you might think, I mean, this happened when you were not there. So it's very easy for you to just give them all the information, which he was collaborating with them, you know. And so uh, he participated actively, responding to FTC uh, investigation and aiding them with compliance and all that. And uh, as he was doing that, right, uh, Sullivan was involved in the presentation of uh, in, in the presentation of what happened, you know, to FCC in March. 2016 uh, about, and he was also to brief the agency about Uber cybersecurity program. So he testified, okay, everything was fine in October. And then guess what? Uh, in that same year, whilst he was doing, he was testifying and giving them information about an incident that happened in 2014, Uber got breached again. Uber had an incident again where they got breached. And this time it was massive. Right, so approximately about 57 users' uh, data were compromised, including drivers and users. You know, so everybody like yourself and myself, uh, if you take Uber or you're a driver, your data was somewhere in there. And guess what? The attackers use the same vulnerability that they use or the same weakness in Uber system that they used in 2014 to breach Uber. They use the same thing to breach them in 2016. And th this breach occurred whilst, you know, Sullivan was giving testimony and they were still dealing with the 2014 breach, right? FTC was dealing with 2014 breach. So if you were Sullivan, were you going to uh, report this new breach to FTC or you were just going to let it be? So guess what? He chose not to report. Right, he chose just to push it uh, under the rug and to pay the attackers. And also, we are going to get into the details of how they tried to do that. Right, so he tried to conceal the breach whilst he was working with these this agency, which is responsible for you know checking this thing. And they were investigating a breach that happened two years before, and you got breached now. Whilst we are still going through this, uh, and he even you know, told his subordinates to try and keep this confidential uh, for fear of negative publicity and also some repercussions. And I think he kind of really felt that uh, ultimately he's responsible for everything cybersecurity within the company, right? But he took it uh, very personal and also probably together with, I think the former CEO in the company, uh, they decided to, this wasn't good because we are in the public space or the news for this. And then there is another one, which funny enough, the same vulnerability, meaning they didn't do anything about the 2014 vulnerability, right? So what did Sullivan do? Uh, he paid the hackers. So he told everybody who knew this to shush and he paid the hackers 100,000 plus, right? And made them sign a non-disclosure agreement uh, stating that no data was stolen when this attack occurred, right? So 
you know, everything was good. Until, and he also failed to tell, tell like the counsel for uh, Uber, right? So the lawyers, he didn't tell the legal team or anybody. Uh, he did this together with, him, with himself and uh, probably maybe, uh, I think if anybody was, else was involved, they would have probably also been in court. So maybe, probably he was there, you know, low hanging fruit that they could easily get, but, you know, I don't really know that part of that. But some quarters say he kind of talked to the CEO who was, Back, back, back then, who was the CEO when he was the C, uh, when he was the chief uh, security officer? So they decided, or he decided not to, because he was he's ultimately responsible for reporting this. He decided not to report it. And what he did was this. So how did he pay the hackers? So Uber has a bounty, uh, back bounty program, right? And we were explain back bounty. Uh, so Uber has a back bounty program. So. Uh, Sullivan thought it wise, instead of just paying the hackers, uh, that will be something else. So he kind of made this look like it was an ethical hacker or a white hat hacker who breached their system through their bounty, uh, a back bounty program. So they have to, if you are doing back bounty for the company and you find a vulnerability, they have to pay, right? So that was how they put it in the books. So with ethical hackers, when they breach your system, they'll just let you know they wouldn't steal any information. In this attack, the attackers, they they stole almost like 57 million, uh, you know, uh, user information and driver's information, right? But Sullivan just went ahead and made it look like it was part of the uh, vulnerability management program that they have in place. And attackers or, you know, good hackers were able to find this information and he paid them off duly for the hard work that they did, right? But that wasn't the case. It was an actual hack and they stole that information and he had them, you know, pay, he paid them off to, to just uh, keep it on the low. And they even signed a non-disclosure agreement. How the, well, the other word, do you sign a non-disclosure agreement with hackers? Uh, let's see how that plays out. So in 2017, so everything was fine until 2017 when Uber had a new management. And the new management wanted to, you know, when the new CEO and new other people, uh, Sullivan was still there, right, as the chief security officer. So when the new management took over, they wanted to investigate what is going on with the first hack, with the second one. And I think they suffered one 2011 proud to the 2014, uh, proud to the 2014 and 2016. So, they wanted to investigate this. So obviously Sullivan is going to be the first point of call. Well, when they asked Sullivan, he told the CEO, you know, there was uh, a bounty hunt program that, you know, uh, there, there was like a bridge, but nothing was stolen in terms of data, right? Uh, they probably didn't take his word for it. They did the investigation and they discovered the truth that indeed uh, data was stolen and they reported this information to FTC. So they kind of pulled a rag right under him. So they report, which he should have known and he should have done the right thing. They reported to the FTC because the new management didn't want to be part of this uh, nice jail sentence, right? Because they knew better, right? So they reported it and then that is, so that is the background behind why Sullivan got dragged to court and and all that, and the sentence that he got, right? And now he's a case study, so. And we are going to just, before we get into the technical facts about this, uh, we are just building our case and we are learning about incidents, right? So this is how far an incident can get you in a company. If you're a cybersecurity professional, even if you're the CEO of the company or you are the owner of the company, right? If he would have reported this, I mean, it's not through, it's not through any fault of his. Like I said, uh, incidents they will happen to every company. It's just a matter of when. So don't take it too personal when you encounter one to try and cover stuff and shield stuff. Well, if they think you didn't do your job well and you didn't put in some measures and you are going to get fired, fine, so be it. You are not the only person who has been fired in that position, right? But to actually go to court and to be sentenced uh you don't want any of that right so and two 
if Uber at that time, I'm not sure this is kind of educated guess and speculation. Uh, I'm sure they have the structures in place. They should have an incident response team. They, they should, for a company of that size, if they are doing everything right, uh, they should have a robust incident response team. So keyword on robust. And this team would have handled this swiftly, right? So there should be somebody on there who is the legal person on the HR, PR, and the rest. And if they had a well-structured team, they wouldn't have allowed their chief security officer to push this under the rug. Because if the team is you know, uh, on point and they are working and doing what they're supposed to be doing, the legal people will be in the know, HR will be in the know, and they know the steps to take. Everybody knows their part to play within an incident response team. So for him to be a one-man show and to decide whether to you know, push it under the rug or to uh, do something about it or not to do something about it, uh, that was a big flaw in the structures that Uber had at that time. Right? They, they could have easily saved themselves all this trouble. And this uh, Sullivan, uh, Sullivan guy could have also saved himself a lot of uh, trouble because it's not its fault. The company got breached, right? Whoever was the CISO when they got breached the first time, they didn't do anything about that weakness or probably pretend that they did. And attackers use the same you know, it's like you got hit by the same car at the same spot twice, uh, right? I mean, like, that's not good. So you shouldn't take the full blame for this. You should just, hey, we got breached again, but I mean, uh, what do I know? I just got here. He could have got away with that, right? But he chose to, he took it too personal, thinking, I mean, saving the company's, you know, reputation. But then now the company is still intact. Reputation is good. Guess what you did to your own reputation? Uh, not so good. So let's look at the technical facts about this. Now, for the hack that happened in uh, 2014, this is what happened. Uh, a hacker, the, the hacker or the hackers who were able to bridge uh, Uber's systems and their, uh, their network, this is what they did. They purchased login credentials or sensitive, uh, they purchased like sensitive uh, credentials for, okay, so I think that is for 2000 and Uber has so many breaches. Let's just stick with this one. Uh, there's 2014, 116, and then also 23. We will look at 23. So with this one, what had happened was that uh, one of the uh, uh, developers, one of Uber software developers mistakenly published uh, something on GitHub. Now, if you don't know GitHub, you can look it up. It's like the, how do I even classify it? It's, it's like, a, like a spot where all IT folks, especially cybersecurity folks, software developers and the rest, they post uh, information and data and what they are doing. They post it on there. Uh, that way other people can also use those resources, you know, in their line of work and also for studies and practice. So I think I even have a GitHub account. It's been a while, but uh, you post things on there, right? That you can share. So this uh, software developer, he shared a code on there and the code had some sensitive information in there. So anybody who had the code was able to have uh, a full admin privilege on their AWS service. And also, a downfall to that was that they were storing everything in AWS. They were storing it in plain test, which, I mean, for a company like Uber in 2014, storing data in plain test on AWS, I don't know who was doing that, but that is a big no-no, right? That is a huge no-no. Uh, and mostly, like I tell, you know, during cyber chats and during classes and everything, I tell everybody, or companies who are not taking security seriously, uh, not pointing any fingers, but the big ones. Because they are so big, sometimes they get complacent. Uh, oversight is lost. So people are doing you know, anything and everything that they want. So that is what happened because Uber shouldn't have been storing this in plain test. If this data was encrypted and attackers were able to get their hands on it, they can't really do much with it, right? Unless they're able to crack the encryption which 
if you're encrypting with the latest uh, form of encryption, like the strongest types like AWS and the different variants that comes with it, they wouldn't have been able to do that. Now, also for the software uh, engineer who just shared the code, I don't know what processes they have in place for you know uh, software engineers to have access to certain type of data. I mean, he's a software engineer, he might have it. But then also, what policy do they have on engineers posting on GitHub, which is a public you know, uh, network that anybody can get on and use and share, right? So that is also kind of questionable. But this is what really happened. So somebody mistakenly posted something that other people could easily use to have access to their AWS uh, servers. And they were storing everything in plain test. So that was really easy peasy. Or attackers. So this was 2014. Now in 2016, a similar thing happened. Similar, right? Almost the same thing. And that is how the attackers were able to breach again. And now, you know, uh, Sullivan was trying to shield it or cover it up. Right. So with that, now this is the like the details of the data that was stolen and all that, right? Not really much in 2014, but they, you know, like, uh, since once customer data is involved, I mean, you have to answer to somebody. Right? So that was 2014. Now in 2022, we've not talked about this. Uh, this They are not in court for this or anything, but they also had a bridge in 2022. And with this bridge, what happened was that the hacker stole, uh, or the hacker purchased stolen credentials, login credentials from the dark web and uh, one of the credentials happened to be that of an Uber employee. And what the hacker did was that the hacker tried to log into the Uber employee's uh, account on Uber's network. It didn't work because Uber has set up uh, multi-factor authentication, which is good. Something that, uh, you know, putting another layer of defense, so using more than two factors of authentication. So, now the attacker wasn't able to just log in with the username and password, right? So how was they going to bypass the multi-factor authentication? So what they did was that they contacted this particular uh, Uber employee and told that Uber employee they are from the security team at Uber and they are doing a test on everybody's account. So they will send him uh, a verification code you know, like an uh, multi-factor authentication notification. So either on your phone or, you know, whatever multi-factor authentication system. Yeah, this, uh, in this instance, it was a phone, right? So they sent the notification to him. He ignored it. And they just keep bombarding him with the notification until he was like, okay, fine, fine. Just, you know, give them the, like the notification or like accepted that he's the one trying to log in. And that is how the hackers were able to get in. And when they did get into his account, they through that, uh, they were able to also compromise their Slack account. And guess what they did? They posted on Slack for the whole company, like for the company that, hey, uh, we, I'm a hacker. Uh, Uber has suffered a data breach. Uh, we've stolen your data. Uh, Slack has been stolen. Confidentiality of data has been breached and all the rest. And this is exactly from uh, what, like what he posted or he or she, I don't know if it's a he, he or she. So this also goes to show you that uh, you think after Uber has suffered 2011, 20, uh, 30, 2014, 20, they keep, you know, uh, history keeps repeating itself. Uh, they might be on top of their game. So I said, you know, uh, a bridge or to experience uh, a bridge or a hack it's just a matter of time, right? A matter of time. You, everybody and anybody can can experience this, but that doesn't also mean you shouldn't do anything about it. You shouldn't be proactive about it. And I'm not saying Uber is not proactive about it. I mean, they are doing something, but uh, they, they can do better. So with that, we are going to jump into FTC. So what are some of the, the things they put in place or uh, what the after school that they have Uber go to? Right. So if you're not doing that well in class, we will organize some special class for you after school. And that is what Uber is in. Right. Uh, Olan, uh, I'll let you in here shortly. Now, uh, this is what FTC 
So FTC fined Uber. I'm not I'm not really sure about the amount. I think it was in the million, in the more than I think a hundred million there about, right? Like they fined them for 2014 and I think some thing around 2016 also as well, right? And they still keep falling for these, you know, uh, attacks. So this is what they have Uber do. So one, uh, Uber, they are going to secure software design and development and testing uh, to include key uh, access key management and uh, secure cloud storage. So, you know, they were bridged because they were storing everything on AWS in a plain test. I don't know who would even do that for such a company, but what do I know? Uh, two, Uber should review and respond to third party security vulnerability reports, including their bug bounty program, right? And three, they should prevent, detect, and respond to attacks, uh, intrusions, and systems fail with, uh, with some sense of urgency, right? And then new provision for Uber, the rest we can go ahead. And all this information, this is from the FTC's website. Right? So none of everything that we are talking about here is directly from the source. Right? Now, uh, we are going to open the floor to do just a little discussion, and then we'll move into incident response, you know, attack it from the academic perspective. And then we'll look at why we need incident response. And next week, we can look at jobs or career path within incident response. And also what are some of the techniques and ways that we can use to protect ourselves as individuals when we encounter an incident. Right. So with that, uh, I'll let Olan ask his question. And then we are going to, uh, I'll give some questions and we are going to discuss it. Go ahead, Olan. Yes, sir. I just I just want to know the employee that got compromised. Is he a current employee or um is not their current employee? So uh, the one in 2014. Yes, the last um illustration, I mean the example you gave that the multi-factor authentication had to be sent. What is one? Yeah. Yeah, uh he was an employee when this happened. I'm not sure if he's still an employee. As at the time it happened, he was an employee. Yeah, of course. I mean, if you're not an employee, you wouldn't have access to the network. So he was an employee when it happened. Yeah, I was just thinking perhaps maybe they did not take his login off when he was disengaged. Maybe. I really don't know. But for him to no, have compromised... Like he's an employee. He he's an employee. So he, he was an employee during the time of the attack. So it's not like he left the company and they didn't take his... Uh, like they didn't like disable his account or delete his account. According to the accounts, he was an employee, like actively engaged in the company. He needs to be really punished and only compromise such. Thank you, sir. Okay. But so as a leader, right, if I'm the CISO for this company, uh, as a leader, when like whatever your, your staff or your subordinates do or fail to do, it's on you, not them. Right, so you should ask yourself, what could I have done to prevent this from happening? Not to just punish the person, right? Because uh, if the person was well-trained when it comes to uh, phishing and social engineering attacks, he wouldn't have fall for this, right? So it's not just, you know, uh, hitting them really hard, but you as the leader, what could you have done better? Or what structures do you have in place that could have prevented this? And like I, like I always say, and during my PCI uh, talk, people, right? We, we, we shouldn't lose sight of people, the people aspect of people, processes, and technology. We can, I, I'm sure Uber has invested in so many tools and software, but all the attacks were through people, right? And that is 95% of the time attacks uh, are through people. So as a leader within the security space, your focus should be, okay, fine. You know, it was through Olan. What could we have done better? Right. All right. So uh, I think another hand is up. RCCG, please go ahead. And then we will take uh, other folks as well. Good evening, sir, uh, doctor. I'm very happy for this case study. Uh, my question is this. And uh, before that, I would like to know the role of defense in depth 
what would the role of this defense in depth play in this uh, case if that uh, employee had another level of authorization above his head? You know, that's number one. And also the role of multi factor authentication. I've had problems uh, with organizations that uh, do multi factor authentication through text messages because uh, they are not, you know, they don't want to use other companies. Uh, authentication software or app, they just choose to go for text or phone calls. Some of financial institutions are guilty of that. So marrying these two, you know, the weakness in any weakness in MFA, you know, and then the defense in depth that could have provided a second layer for that guy that got a good, if he truly handled sensitive information. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. So we will first tackle defense in depth. Right, difference in depth uh, is one of the concepts that we use in cybersecurity architecture and design. Right? So, with difference in depth, we are putting in place layers upon layers of defense. Example, a very practical example: uh, when you are walking down the street and you see a car park, you know, uh, by the street side, and this car is locked, but then they've also locked the steering wheel with a certain device, and probably locked you know, the gear with also a certain device. Uh, why would they lock the car from the outside and still lock the steering wheel in the inside? This, that is an example of defense in depth, right? So defense in depth, when the attacker is able to uh, bridge the door, right? They are able to maneuver their way and they unlock the door. Even though they've been able to unlock the door, there's another hurdle in front of them for them to jump before they can steal the car. Yeah. So if nobody saw them, you know, trying to break into the door and they were able to get in, at least somebody will see them struggling to, you know, undo the lock on the steering wheel. So, and if I'm an attacker and I want to steal a car and I see two cars, one with a steering lock on it, the other with none, and I can easily break into both cars, which one do you think I'm going to steal? I mean, I ain't got time to be undoing your steering wheel. Take your car. I'm just still the one with no steering wheel. So, mm. defense in depth, one, you know, they can serve as a deterrent. Two, it puts a lot of obstacles in front of the attacker, right? So, for example, uh, the multi-factor authentication is a technique that we use for defense in depth, right? So, uh, for this particular scenario, I think they were using a dual-factor authentication, not a multi-factor authentication. Because with multi-factor authentication, you are using more than two factors of authentication, right? And for uh, factors of authentication, uh, if if you you are new to security, uh, we're just going to do a brief uh, intro here. So in identity and access management, we have uh, five factors of authentication, right? Something you are, so something you are, something you have, something somewhere you are, something you do, uh, something you the five. I mean, I'll go through them later, right? So something you are is something that is on you as a person. So your your eyes, your face, facial recognition, uh, your like thumbprint and all that, your voice, right? Uh, all those are something you are. So if we are using any of those biometrics to authenticate or to grant, you know, to use to as a form of identity and access management, uh, one of the strategies we are using uh, is a single factor of authentication, right? So if, if you are using facial recognition and your fingerprint and your voice, it is all one factor, right? Sometimes people get confused. If you are using your facial recognition and your thumbprint and your voice, they will think is you are using three factors of authentication. They all fall under the same category of, of authentication, right? That is something you are. Now, something you have, you can they can send a pin to your phone. They can send, if you can have uh, the Google uh, Authenticator, that will automatically generate numbers for you to type in. All that will be classified. Anything that you have on you as a per not on you as a person, like your biometrics, but any object that you have that you can use for authentication uh, is something that you have, right? Now, something you know is the last one that uh, I wanted to refer to. So, something you know will be a password or some PIN or something that you know already is in memory. They don't have to send it to you. You know it. So mostly your username and password. Right. So like that is something you know. Uh, so we can get into all that, but 
for you to use multi-factor authentication, you have to use at least three of what we talked about, right? So if you are using something you know, something you have, uh, somewhere you are, right? You are using three factors of authentication. Oh. So in this case, if they were using three factors of uh, three factors of authentication, when the attacker had their password, that is something you know, right? And the attacker compromised the password. The, the, the attacker is trying to use that to log in. It wouldn't work because the other factors of authentication that you have to go through, right? Uh, so the other factors of authentication that you have to go through, one was, you know, uh, something you have because they sent him a notification or they, like they sent him a pin on his phone and he gave them the pin and they were able to take over his account. That means they were using just two factors of authentication, not multi. Multi is more than two. Two is dual. Dual or two-factor authentication. So in this case, they were not even using multi-factor authentication. So for layers of defense, we can do the factors of authentication. We can also add other stuff to it, right? Uh, so uh, also, like we can we can mix it up, frankly. Uh, so that is kind of a cybersecurity architecture uh, discussion. So hopefully this helps. Uh, now we are going to move on to uh, Therese. I got your name right. Uh, I think like somebody is having issues with your audio. Abina, please uh, make sure you are muted. Uh, please go ahead, Therese. You are still muted. Oh, you are muted, but I, I can't hear your voice. Okay, Fabi, go, go ahead. Yes, hi, everyone. Um, Doctor, my question is, um, when you were talking, you said something about back bounty that you said you explained, but I didn't hear you explaining. So if you can do that for us so that we will know. Okay, great, great. So uh, back bounty is a program that companies put in place as part of their vulnerability management program. Right. Every company is supposed to have a vulnerability management program uh, under which you are going to have, mostly when you say vulnerability management program, people think it's just doing vulnerability scans and then that's it. No, it, there is more that goes into a vulnerability management program. Your scans are part of it, but that is not all of it. Uh, vulnerability research, uh, your bug bounty program, and then responding to vulnerability research or vulnerabilities that are found within your infrastructure from outside researchers. Uh, that are all part of your vulnerability management program, right? So with Bug Bounty, what organizations do is this. Uh, they set up they set up a fake network to mimic the original network, right? And they, uh, they invite all hackers around the world, that is ethical hackers around the world, to hack into the fake uh, network. And when they are successful and they are able to, you know, bridge the network or they identify any vulnerabilities, they will present it to the company and the company will pay them money, right? And because they were able to, they spend their time and energy and their knowledge to be able to discover vulnerabilities within your infrastructure, right? So when they find that, the organizations will go ahead and fix, use that information to fix the vulnerabilities in their actual production uh, infrastructure, right? So that is the back bounty program. Now hackers, there are some hackers who are freelance hackers, ethical hackers, uh, All that is all that they do for a living, right? And some of them are making good money. If you don't find any vulnerabilities, you don't get paid nothing, right? So they invite, and when you Google right now, if you go online, uh, all companies who are very serious about security, they have such a program, right? So where they invite attackers and you know, vulnerability researchers to try to break into their system. And it's not the actual production system. It's one that mimics the original production system. So any uh, issues that are found in here, uh, you might be able to find the same issues in the real uh, network. So they call it the bug bounty uh, program. So bug meaning, you know, a weakness in coding, which is, we, we will say like a bug, there's a bug in the system. Uh, so bug bounty, you are finding, just like how they do, I think, human bounty program where people who have 
who are being, you know, sought after by the law and the on the run. We have people who get paid to go around and chase them and to catch them and bring them back. It's, it's a similar concept, but here you are chasing vulnerabilities within an infrastructure and you are catching them and, you know, letting the owners of the system know and they get paid for it, right? So in this situation, when the hackers were able to bridge Uber, uh, the chief security officer, he wanted to pay them off for them to shut up. So he made it look like it was, they were ethical hackers who hacked into their bug bounty, who were successful in their bug bounty program and they, they had to pay them, right? But in actual fact, these hackers were demanding money that, hey, if you don't pay us, we are going to disclose your information and we are going to let everybody know we're able to breach your network, right? And they have stolen over 57 million uh, you know, customer information. So he made it look like it was through the bug bounty program that they breached their fake network. Uh, so they didn't steal any data, right? With bug bounty, when you breach the network, and one is not the original network, uh, so there is like fake data also there. So even if you steal that, it's nothing, right? So that is how he was making it look like. So hopefully everybody understands that piece. Right, Derek, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Yes, doctor, a uh, quick question here for you. Uh, I just want to make uh, find out, uh, so in other words, I, it, does it mean that uh, these people were not doing annual auditing to make sure that um, their controls or the, the VAC scan were not looking into details to uh, remediate all the open port or the vulnerability scanners that they, they have? The, 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 open vulnerabilities that they have? Well, you know, with all these, like with attacks that we looked at, the attackers were not, they didn't really breach their network. They use social engineering and then one engineer also gave everything away on a silver platter, right? So they right. use social engineering to, to breach their network, not to kind of like go head on, like head on with their network devices or like with the software that they have protecting their network. Right. So even if you are doing your scans, you are doing everything right, and Derek decides to publish his credentials on on YouTube, or you know he just somebody calls him and yelling at him that he's from HR and they need him to really confirm this code they are sending to his phone, and he just gives them the pin. I mean, uh, I don't think your firewall is going to slap Derek in uh, on on the face and say why are you doing that. Right. So, so sometimes mostly these attacks are successful because uh, attackers are using they are they are using social engineering attacks. And that works better than trying to breach a company's network by just going head on. Right. Uh, most mm -hmm. most attackers now, most hackers, they are not aside the APT ones who are like on steroids. Most of them are just script kiddies. They are just trying out to see if it works. They don't really. They are not that skilled. That is what I mean, right? So if you know how to generate a efficient attack and just send it to random people and have like a payload behind it, somebody will click on it. It's easy. And once they click on it, if I'm using Keylogger and you click on it, now I have access to your system. Everything you are typing comes to me, right? Your messages, your pictures, you are sending, everything comes to me, right? And like, I didn't really have to be... Uh, like a like a hacking wizard to be able to do this like you can teach a five-year-old to do this and they can do it in in a minute right so uh they were they might be doing everything right passing their audits but if we don't keep you know uh tabs on people and on social engineering attacks and always in their face with security awareness this is what happens right okay. so hopefully that helps so how many times do you, I, I mean, does it based on the company policy, how you have to tr give your uh, employees um, training awareness, like every six months or every one year or every three months? I mean, oh. I, I see a couple of things in um, uh, next and then uh, CIS that they give different, uh, they give you a scenario like every year, but does it mean that you have to stick with one year or you have to stick with six months or you have to stick with three months based on your, based on the company policy? So that is the deal, right? In mm -hmm. security, most of the things that we call best 
practices. Uh, so mm -hmm. most of the things that you find in PCI DSS framework in uh, RMF and in, in the rest CIS and the rest, they are all supposed to be the bare minimum that you are supposed to do for security. Right, so mostly for security awareness training, generally speaking, the best practice out there is you should do it a year, once a year. That is what most of the frameworks are talking about. Now, if you want to avoid such scenarios and having your company uh, being used as a case study, then I'll do it quarterly, right? I'll do it. So just to you know, uh, add to my own point, uh, how long has Coca-Cola been around? Many why, years. Why are they advertising every day like they just started their company? They want to make more money. <laughs> because in marketing, you have to stay in the mind of your customers the whole time. So same principle applies here. If you're in charge of security for your company, you want awareness of such attacks to be in the minds of your staff the whole time. So you have to always be in their face. So me personally, I'll do it every exactly. month. Every Friday of the month, we, we do like a case study like this. We bring it up. Now, everybody is interested in this because they know Uber. They they want to really find out what happened, right? They want to dig into it. Now, oh, okay, so this guy did this. So now when you are there and somebody calls you, hey, uh, we want to verify that, you know, you are still part of this company. So we are sending you a pin. Uh, oh, I know that trick. I'm not going to fall for it, <laughs> right? But if they don't know, I mean, they will, fall, they will easily fall for it. The smartest person in the room will fall for that, frankly, right? So you have to be always in the, if you are waiting for a year for awareness training, okay, good luck to you and your company. You are going to be the next on the chopping board for uh, a case study, right? So, uh, Ellen, go ahead. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Oh, Alan. Yes. Sorry, sorry. I was muted. Yeah. Uh, this magnitude company, I mean, Uber is a big company. So I believe they should have the incident response team. Um, unless Mr. Sullivan, you know, uh, you know, all the all the teams told them, you know, keep it confidential. This link. The second part, it hacked 2014 and 2016. By that time, they should be, you know, they learn their lesson and they learn their lesson and then, mm -hmm. you know, teaching all these uh, employees uh, not to happen. Uh, on the tw 2022 is a different thing. I mean, you already answered uh, my question before this, you know, and, and com you know, you know, like um, awareness all the time, you know, like every week, every month, you have to teach your employee, you know, like, um, um, you know, identify any potential risk. So this could harm, you know, WhatsApp, you know, for us, it's a good lesson also, you know, I, I got a lot of uh, texting, you know, phishing attack on WhatsApp, you know, asking you for things like that. So um, from 2016, they should not their lesson, they should keep it. And 2022 is a, is a big lesson too, you know, they need to push, uh, you know, awareness of security at all times, 24 yes. seven. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Elam. Uh, Rini, go ahead. Okay, so Mr. One of the things that I didn't see, I'm just trying to get the facts, but I didn't hear anything of that Mr. Sullivan was really vetted when they hired him. And I'm thinking that he may have already scoped out what he was going to do in the fact that once he got hired, he had all the opportunity in the world to do what he needed to do to breach Uber. So that's where I'm going at. I'm looking at um, what did he do before he got there? What access did he have access to before he got into Uber? And no one seemed to say anything, even when they when he was in court, there was nothing mentioned about, well, I, I hate to tell you, I wanted to be a lawyer, so this is really good for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking at all of these breaches that went through the process and no one went back to really investigate what this man was really doing. 
before he got in with Uber to be a big dog in there and did not even check to vet him good enough so that they would have found out some things about this man before they actually hired him. That's just my thoughts on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, rightly so. So mostly let me let you, like, you know, give you some insights. And, you know, most people on here on managerial levels will, will, will attest to this. So mostly uh, at that level, right, at the C-suite level, uh, sometimes it's just good old boy club. Right. So uh, you are just hooking yourselves up. So not to say it's not on merit, but it's not on merit sometimes. Right. So if I know you from way back from somewhere and we are buddies, we are, you know, golf buddies, we are drinking buddies. Hey, you know, there's a spot open here, John. You want to, you know, I think you'd be a good. And then, right. And they get all the big money and they have people under them who are. So for folks, if you come in like that and you are not very technical uh if you're a good leader you'll still be able to manage it because then you have them do the job and you just you know steer them in the right direction but i think for sullivan uh, personally i don't i've not researched into what he did previously to this right but for him to get on that level at uber was he really the old saying is keep your friends close keep your enemies <laughs> yeah. closer <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know so uh like i don't really know like what what transpired, you know, for the employment piece and all that. But yeah, I think like he took this too personal in terms of like he thought that was like a big, you know, uh, dent on his reputation as the security, uh, as the chief security officer for the company, right? So he was going to just, you know, maneuver his way and uh, this is just going to go away. But it didn't really work that way for him because of the new management that came in. They wanted to come clean, right? And then also, uh, not to fall for the same type of attack uh, by or more probably like the same attackers uh, moving on, you know, forward. So yes, yeah, good observation. Uh, Tara Z, I'm not sure if, you know, your audio is good now. You can go ahead. And if I got your name wrong, uh, please forgive me. Yeah, I think your audio is still you, you like you still having audio issues. So likewise, we try to fix that. I'll let uh Akikum Akikumi, please uh you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, so I think you're also having issues with audio. Uh Olu, please go ahead and uh, you can also ask your question or make your contribution. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, sir. I'm here. Doctor okay, okay, go ahead. Uh, yes, I um, yeah, I just want to emphasize more on the uh, social engineering hacking thing. There's uh, this uh, podcast that I listen to. There's a lady on there that has won the competition four times. She's a stay at home mom. She's not technical. She doesn't know anything about hacking. She doesn't know how to do anything about computers. And she has won the competition four times in a row. So they interviewed her and said, how does she, how is she able to break into all these organizations uh, quite easily? She said uh, she always uh, follow uh, somebody in the hiding department on social media for a company that she's starting to. And she would notice when you have to be a female, she would notice when they have to go on vacation. You know, people post when they're on vacation on social media. And then she would call in into the organization and said, oh, well, um, I'm currently out sick. Um, I've not logged in and uh, I've been hospital for the past couple of days. I forgot my password and my uh, and my login details. And guess what? The ID department would give her, they would have her, they would give her a new uh, login password credentials to get into the system. She said, that's wow. how simple it is. Yes, she said, that's how simple it is <laughs> to get into these organizations. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that so that, cool. yeah, that still just go to uh, reiterate the point of awareness training. So the people at the like that at the help decks, you know, uh, they are just trying to be very uh, helpful and very, like willing to help anybody. But you know, that is like an easy win for an attacker. 
just to you know use what they think they are using to help you to you know uh, turn around and get the credentials that easy right yeah great uh, great uh, insight thank you uh, olu go ahead all right thank you dr edu uh, so basically, I've been looking at this case for some time now, and that inspired uh, a particular research within my organization. Uh, so uh, my question about this is basically to ask you directly, looking at what has happened over the years, do you think that we've learned enough for us to be able to stop this kind of an attack, uh, especially looking at uh, the cybersecurity strategy that was released about two months ago by the Biden administration, uh, and also in line with what we experienced with the, um, the pipeline ransomware attack. So my question is basically, have we learned enough? I know that during with, this, with the cybersecurity strategy, we've moved from being reactive to practice, but have we really learned enough based on your experience thank you yeah uh thank you so as yes and no right uh we are humans so we continue to exhibit human you know uh, attributes and traits uh we are always inquisitive we are always curious right we have different mood swings we are happy today you start tomorrow uh we are angry the next day right so and attackers they they study people. They are like all attackers who are using social engineering. Uh, they are well vested in, you know, uh, identifying human weaknesses and using that as a point of attack, right? So, like the lady uh, that I think uh, Olumi was. Uh, sorry if I got your name uh, wrong because it was a lot of folks on there. So, uh, Akikumi. Yeah, so like the lady that uh, he was talking about, right? Mostly, I think for like, I've, I've had one lady also call a bank. Like she just did it on real, like a real show. So they were like, no, you can never get my credentials for the bank. He, he's like, okay, really? She called the bank. She had two phones, right? Called the bank. And whoever was on the other side, I think Bank of America or any of these banks, and she was asking for, so if it was me, right? She mentioned my name, you know, Dr. Edu is my husband. Uh, I like, I'm home with the kids. And then on the other phone, she has like a voice of some kids crying. So she will press on it and the kids are crying and she will be like, oh, sorry, sorry. You know, like, like, like the kids are really uh, like bothering me and, and my husband is not here. And, you know, she make she tries to make it very urgent and in like a very chaotic environment. To the point where the person on the other side is like, you know, so frustrated, they just go ahead and give her their bank credentials, like the log, like the. I think sometimes she took the ATM pin because she couldn't find it, or she doesn't know she has the card, but she doesn't know the ATM. Pin. They told her all that, right? So she has really studied people, and she know the kind of strings to pull and the nerves to hit for people to react in a certain way, right? It's like if you are a security guard and the lady approaches you and she wants to get into the building and you're like, hey, show me your credentials and she's holding the coffee. And before you realize she has like spilled the coffee all over you, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, digging into her bag and she's clumsy and she's falling over and okay, go, go. <laughs> you just don't want to deal with it, <laughs> right? But that is a trick that they actually use, right? So. Uh, they study human, you know, weakness and human, and they use that. So uh, as we are, you know, uh, getting, you know, more uh, aware of some of the tricks, they are also switching it up, right? So they are getting smarter and smarter. So we have to always stay ahead of, that is why I was asking, Coca-Cola has been around for uh, maybe probably most of us, uh, but why are they still advertising like they, they just came up yesterday? Because they want to be in your face, in your heart, in your minds the whole time. So when you go anywhere and you are, they ask you for a soft drink and you just, you are, you just don't want to choose. The first thing that comes to mind will be cool. Because you've seen it so much and you don't even know you've been programmed like that. But that is how, how we should advertise 
security awareness training or how should we advertise security awareness within our companies, right? And it's good we are talking about this for the Cyber Security Awareness Month, right? So uh, we will go to uh, Pristine and then we will go to Faith and then Mr. Odro and uh, Emery and we'll move on. So Pristine. Oh, okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Adu. I uh, want to really thank you for this platform. As a fellow former instructor at the University of Maryland College Park or Global Campus, I'm nice. really pleased to be on this platform. And I taught data communication and networking at that university. And nice. like everybody is saying, my data communication class, one thing I always try to my senior student, particularly when it comes to data security or security in general, was people are our number one threat. And also they are our number one defender. So educating your employees, your staff, on the issue of them being the number one defender and being the number one threat will go a long way in the security of, or the prevention of all these type of threats or all type of threats for that matter. So I really just want to add that to it that having taught this in this area, the stress is on us, the users. The user are your number one defender. They are your number one threat. So and what we do to make them fall in the positive line of that, being the number one defender, is education, education, education. Our last job, we used to receive email two or three times. Uh, <clears throat> spoofing email will come, but people will stay far for it. Even my boss fell for the email, okay? So people do it. So, but we have to be able to actually continue to educate our users. Those, these are the people that can save our information, our organization, our data. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll go to Faith. Hey, Dr. Adu, thank you so much for this opportunity and everything you're doing. Um, I'm just curious, some of these hackers or, uh, could they have been um, uh, cyber security professionals that got corrupted that is actually doing this thing to know this type of information or what to do to get people? Or oh, I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, for the hackers to be able to do what they do, uh, they are cyber security professionals in a way, right? So cyber security professionals on the other side, uh, who are doing bad things because at least you have to know something to be able to execute this. And for some of them, it's just, uh, for them is, so for the ones who are not just uh, doing, you know, uh, bare minimum sc like scamming stuff and the ones who wants to get on your AWS and the rest, they have to be skilled in that area to be able to know the type of encryption and to be able to hit you with different types of malware. At least they have to be well, you know, uh, vested in those areas. Right. So, but it will amaze you that the skill level that you need to do that is not even that much. Frankly, you don't need to be that. You don't need to have been uh, like a hacking guru for the past 15 years to be able to these. I can show you how to do some of these in like maybe less than 10 minutes. Right. And you will be able to execute and do some of these easy. And guess what? All the tools that are used for these type of attacks, they are all free. And the ones that are used for defense, they cause a premium. So maybe probably just speculating who is behind the ones that are used for the attacks. I don't know. That's the scary not, part. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so uh, maybe somebody's making the ones free for attack and then also doing one for defense. I mean, who knows? But like all the ones that all the, like name it, all the tools that are used for attacks, 99% of them are open source. They are all free tools. The ones that are used for defense, they will cost you a fortune. So I don't know how, why that is or how that is, but in which ways, Kwame, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, you, you're welcome. Great. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Odo. So, so, Prof, I have a question and a concern. Uh, in most companies, right, Let's say if you are sending out uh, a phishing email or like like a you put it up 
uh, a setup for like a fishing attack or for, or for or the whole company. And then you meet up with your higher apps that this email is going to go to the, the whole population of the company or the employees. But then yeah. they, they they choose to say, okay, we have this, we have this uh higher app, like the CEOs and the CFOs that they they exempt them from receiving these okay. emails. Okay. And it has been bothering me. Like, why would you uh why would you just why would they want to limit who can get access, who can receive these emails, no matter what I believe. Oh, you told me that no matter what, the, no matter the standard or the level of the person, they should all be trained. But in a situation where they think this is the owner of the company or this is the uh, CEO and we don't want to barge him with this kind of email, so he's allowed to like be exempted from the list. And I want to know what your contribution to was that. And what if you were in your situation, what would you do? Okay, so I think uh just to uh repeat Kwame's question if i'm getting you right you mean when you are sending out an internal fishing campaign just as a part of your awareness training uh yes, when you are sir. sending that uh, email out to see who's going to fall for it and then those people will be identified for retraining when you are sending it out uh your boss is telling you don't send it to the ceo don't send it to like people in in like top management positions like, yeah. is that what I'm yes, that's what I'm saying. And those are the target that everybody is after. But then they eliminate those people from the list. And I've been always in a meeting. I've been pushing, but they still think those people are too busy, too successful, not to be bothered. And it is 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 always got to me like. Uh, but they they all tell you like you don't get it. So maybe I don't get it, or maybe you have to tell me something different. Yeah. So. Uh, everybody should be part of this, right? Uh, everybody is susceptible. Everybody, you know, can fall for this. So it's not because of you are, you are the company owner. I mean, company owners and people in top management, they should be more concerned about this than anybody else. So they should be all be part of this. But I think maybe probably they want to say, that, like save themselves from humiliation because mostly they are the ones who will fall for it first <laughs> before anybody. So... They don't want you to know they are the ones who've been falling for this because everybody's name will be on there if they fall for this when you do your internal uh our uh, like fishing campaign. So maybe they think they are giving them that respect or that preference, but they are not really doing themselves any favor because attackers don't care whether you are the company owner or not. And for company owners, uh they're, they're like a special type of fishing attack that targets. Uh, people within, you know, the C-suite. So your CISO, your CFO, and the rest. What is the name of that type of fishing attack? Well, Willing. Okay, I think, was Willing. it? Big Willing. Well, well, that's what I do. It's called well. Willing. Okay, so it's, called, it's called Willing. Willing. Willing, Willing attack. Willing. It's called yeah. Willing, Willing attack. attack. It's a okay. Willing the attack. big well, the big way in the sea. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> right. So attackers, they see everybody, you know, they see us as the sea or like the big lake and everybody else will be a little fish, small fish, uh, some, you know, uh, uh, like different types of fish. But the people who are really carrying a lot of weight within the company, like your CISOs and the rest, anybody in top management, they are considered a whale. Right. So if you catch one of them, it's a big catch. So it's a whaling attack. Right, so uh, if they are able to catch maybe John who works in finance, I mean, John cannot really sign any check or they cannot trick John to transfer any money to anywhere. But if they intercept the email from uh, your CFO to some other company with, the, with, with an invoice and they change the uh, bank account details on the invoice and they send it back to you, hey, we just changed our details, so send it to this uh, 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 the, like send it to this bank instead. You know, they just got like $5 million for free. But John couldn't have given them that. All John can do is just click on it and have them access to the, to the company's network. And maybe probably there is no money on the network. So uh, 
the whales are supposed to be well protected and protecting them is making sure they are also well trained even beyond your ordinary staff uh, they should have additional you know uh, top management training when it comes to social engineering and the type of attacks that they are susceptible to because for them uh, if one of them we catch one of them i mean it's a big catch right so just imagine if you catch like uh three or four different types of fish you know like the size of like like the size of your hand as compared to you catching a whale i mean come on like you can eat whale for 20 years and still you know not be able to finish it but so they should take it more seriously that is what i'm trying to say uh, for you you can only push so far they are the owners of the company you are there working as a security manager you can't really force them to do anything so you can advise if they take it fine if they don't if they get breaks uh you are not the one who is going to face anything right because you can there at that point you can tell them i told you so there's very little that you can do Probably just engage with them and try to you know convince them to your side and let them see uh the importance of what you are doing all right uh, so we are going to move on to i think brian and then uh if and Julius, and then we are going to continue. And we, we will finish, you know, here shortly. And we are going to announce our uh, scholar, our scholarship winners at the end of. Go ahead, Brian. Hey, thank you, Dr. Adu. I just want to chime in for some of the people who are wondering um, how difficult it is for some of these fishing attacks. And, you know, like the, the one lady asked, are these cybersecurity professionals? You know, <laughs> I believe in the standard install of Kali Linux. Uh, you can turn on the web server service mm -hmm. and there is an app where you can deploy it in like maybe five minutes. And if you have the email, you can pick whether you want to send a, a LinkedIn account, right? And create a, a uh, efficient email so say I send you, hey, I see you from the Arithmetic Inc. Cyber Chat. Please join my LinkedIn request. And I'll email it to you. You'll be like, oh, and it looks like an official LinkedIn email. You click on it, and there it is. I have your information as soon as you click on the link. And that's built into Cali Linux. You, you don't even have to download anything. Just install Cali Linux. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, thanks for that input, Brian. So, like, is that easy, or is that is, is that easy? And uh, now with AI tools, it's very easy to, for AI to also like generate like your whole email scripts that you are going to use for your phishing attack, right? Uh, and sometimes, like, so when maybe one of these days we will jump more into social engineering. And some of the characteristics, you know, and some of the tips and tricks that attackers are using to really make maybe next week when we jump into how to protect ourselves, we'll probably go into that area as well. So you can easily read some of the signs. So they'll put a sense of agency in it. They will put some form of authority, familiarity, just like Brian was talking about. Hey, Brian, this is, you know, uh, John from we we are all on the arithmetic cyber chat. Of course, you were on the Ritzman cyber chat. So, okay, okay, so now your guard is down. You know, okay, Brian, okay. Let's link up on LinkedIn. You just click on it, does it, right? So uh, that is that easy. So they use, and they were able to get you on here because of familiarity. You are familiar with Ritzman's uh, authority, right? Ritzman's, okay, I was at Ritzman's, Ritzman's, or they will say, I'm from IRS. They will call you on the phone. I'm from IRS. Uh, there are, there's a problem with your taxes. So uh, we think you owe some money, but, you know, take heart. Just confirm your social security number and, you know, we will check everything and everything will be good. Now, if you are from IRS, why are you asking me of my social security number in the first place? You guys gave me the social security number. But because they just said IRS and they said taxes, nobody wants to own IRS nothing or you don't want to hear from IRS. So you start panicking, you know, on the low key. Now, so what, what can I do? Now, that is maybe Brian, probably Brian drinking coffee and, you know, trying, trying his luck, calling people randomly and telling them he's from IRS, looking for social security numbers and the rest, right? So uh, 
there, there, there is a whole variety of tricks when it comes to social engineering, and they are very easy now to do than ever. So I think we are going to pick the last two or uh, thereabout. So uh, please go ahead, uh, if you ma. Um, good evening, sir. Thank you very much for the class. It's been very insightful. I've learned so much from this case study. In fact, I'm so shocked at how um, how serious this profession is. It's not a joke. Um, so I had a question about the wedding issue, adding when carrying out maybe some exercise to train the staff if senior management should be included. And the last speaker brought that question up. It's been answered. But I want to make an observation because I took the Google IT support certification because I'm making a switch from media to IT. So I started taking some courses of my own. And I noticed that in Google IT support, um, under the, the cybersecurity aspect, they started with um, cryptography. And I was wondering, what's the connection between cybersecurity, excuse me, excuse me, I was wondering the connection between cybersecurity and cryptography. Like, why are they emphasizing so much on this? And that's where I heard about the plain text, cyber, uh, cipher text, and co. And you know, look what looking at this case study, I now see why things have to be hidden. Like, even if you get a breach, at least your data should be, you know, encoded. You know, and then. Another uh, cybersecurity course, I'm preparing for um, Security Plus. And so I have these materials I bought and they listed social uh, engineering as the number one threat, you know? And I was like, why should social engineering be number one? And here again, we're seeing um, exactly, in, you know, this is a real life situation, how social engineering was, you know, played a role in this, um, in this case study. And of, of course, you've talked about how Coca-Cola always um, advertises, and that's how the awareness and training should be you know, presented to the staff. So I'm really grateful. I, I can see the role of social engineering and um, you know, cryptography now. And I've seen, I can see now how not implementing those can actually cause you know, serious issues in the entire um, security posture of an organization. So thank you very much. It was really eye-opening. Thank you. You are welcome. And uh, just to uh, add or to really give you more perspective on uh, on cryptography and, and cybersecurity. So cybersecurity, under cybersecurity, there are different areas. And all these areas, they kind of overlap, right? They all move into each other. So you can't do cybersecurity without having a good working knowledge of all these areas. And cryptography is one, right? So within cryptography, uh, when we send on everything that we do that we have to protect in terms of data. Uh, so before I even get to that point, you know, maybe I'm uh, going all over the place, but let me just go back to the fundamentals. In cybersecurity, we have only one, one thing that everybody is doing regardless of what you are doing, whether you are a penetration tester, whether you are an auditor, what, whatever you are doing, uh, our goal is to help reduce risks to an acceptable level by the organization, right? And like I said, there is nothing like zero risks. So we are reducing it to a point where we can accept that level of risks. Now, how do we reduce risks? And when it comes to risks, what are we really talking about? So risks will materialize if confidentiality is breached or availability is breached or integrity is breached. Right? And now these are the three main pillars that we look at when we talk about security. So if you are doing cybersecurity 101, first thing that they will teach you is the CIA triad and the rest. Now, maybe probably if they don't break it down well for you to understand the whole bigger picture, you wouldn't get it. Now under the C, so the CIA triad, if any of those areas are compromised, then there is a breach, right? And for those areas to be compromised, there has to be a weakness or what we would call a vulnerability within your confidentiality, integrity, and availability setup, right? Or there has to, and two, there has to be a threat that is, you know, readily available to, you know, exploit that vulnerability or that weakness. So how do we protect the confidentiality or how do we protect 
our confidentiality that way there is no weakness or even if there is a weakness how do we protect the weakness there how do we protect the weakness in integrity how do we protect the weakness in availability now that is all that cyber security or everything that everybody is doing is about right we are all playing little you know uh aspects of it or we are helping with little areas to really you know bring the whole bigger you know uh, picture in perspective but if you don't understand how it all looks uh, it's like the blind men who went to see the elephant right somebody held the tail and they they could swear on their life the elephant is like a tread you know <laughs> somebody held the ear and it's like the elephant is like that big somebody held the leg but if you are far back from the elephant mm -hmm. and you see the bigger picture mm -hmm. now you're able to understand why he's saying is like a like a, a, a stick why he's saying is like a trunk why he's saying so that is the perspective that I want everybody to have when it comes to security. If you understand security from that perspective, you can work in any role. Okay. Are we yeah. going to look at incident response process, like the processes? And we nice yes. to look. Yeah. Yes, we will look at that here shortly. Uh, okay. Once we just address these questions real quick, and then we move on. All so right. those are the areas that we are going to look. We will look at that briefly, and then next week we will still come back to incident response, focusing on social engineering and how we can protect ourselves. Right. Because incident response starts with you. How mm -hmm. are you going to react? How are you going to protect yourself when you mm -hmm. do experience an incident? Right. Mm -hmm. So uh so cryptography plays a role when it comes to protecting identity, uh when, when it comes to uh, protecting confidentiality, right? And then also it comes to play when we are protecting integrity as well. And so okay. uh you, we have other forms, you know, access management and the rest. Uh, mm -hmm. So different concepts that we use to help reduce risks. So, mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on, Julius and Olan, and then we will proceed. Go ahead, Julius. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear? Can everybody hear me? I'm in the car. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I just want to say thank you, uh, Doctor Adu, for your time. I'm getting a lot of value. I always get a lot of value on these calls. Um, some some good free nuggets. Uh, I just want to kind of piggyback on something um, a couple of people were saying earlier about uh, like somebody posed a question like, will we ever arrive and be 100 percent secure? Um, and I, I think that we never will be because one of the reasons why we have cybersecurity awareness is to study and do research on human behavior. I mean, I can I can right now probably go into a chat room and pretend like I'm a female, start flirting with some guy. And the first thing he's going to say is. Send me a picture of you. I can send him a rat, a remote access tool, mask it with a picture. As soon as he clicks on the picture, I can have full access to his computer. I mean, that's how easy this stuff is, man. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there so people can see um, just how easy it is, man. It's human behavior is 99.9% .9 of why these breaches take care. And I just wanted to share that with the group. So thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. That is uh, exactly right on the money. And I mean, uh, I think Julius cannot stress on that enough. Uh, it, it's that easy, right? Olan, go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, I just want to ask a question and to know a social engineer, if it's coming to you, how will you attend? How will you confirm it? Let me try to paint, paint a picture. For instance, in America for now, hundreds or thousands if not millions of people are now owing back on their credit um, payments. They are in debt in their credit card. Now, if someone should go to social media and say, if you want, um, let's say, federal government or a grant to clear your social, I mean, your, your debit, your, your debit card, whatever, that you should call this number. And you call in that number, and then they are asking you your address, your social security number, and all that, and all that. How then will you confirm? Oh, this is this is is, is good to be. It's too it's too good to be good. Something is behind it. How will you confirm that? Is there any way you could say such? Okay, so uh, just let me just you know uh, piggyback on what you just said, right? Uh, so I'm there. Olan is my is my brother, my friend. Uh, or we are an acquaintance, and I receive a WhatsApp message from Olan's WhatsApp number that is stating that, hey, Dr. Edu, uh, 
can you really do me a favor? I'm stuck somewhere. Uh, can you send me 200 bucks uh, to this number? I will send it back to you as soon as you know I'm able to get out of whatever uh, area that I'm at, right? When you send this to people that you talk to on a regular basis, on WhatsApp and through, like, through calls, uh, chances that they will call you to verify before they send the money is, is really slim to none. They will first send the money and then they will call you later and be like, hey, Olan, did, did you receive the money? And you're like, what money? Oh, the money that, oh, no, sorry, my, uh, my WhatsApp got hacked. So they took over my WhatsApp. Right. Why didn't you call Olan before you sent the money? So the point that I'm trying to get at here is if you see anything being advertised, hey, the government is giving free money. Uh, OK, go to the gov go to whatever website, the official government website that is at the gov website, dig into it. Right. Or just go to Google is government and just type in government giving free money scam. Well, somebody would have experienced that and they had it right there with the full report, right? So uh, mostly if, you know, you like everybody on here can sense it, but as human as we are, we all want to kind of doubt ourselves and just keep probing and digging, right? You apply for a cybersecurity job and they just reach out to you. Hey, you are really like, you're a good fit. We want to proceed with you. So can you go ahead and give us your social security number and uh, like a copy of your uh, immigration status, your passport or your green card or whatnot? And why are they asking for all that? You didn't even go to an interview. And this is probably not the first time of you being hired. So why are they collecting all these if you are not doing onboarding or you are not doing in-processing at the job, right? But some people go ahead and give all this information because they know it's wrong, but they think, they have a deal or like, you know, I don't, people are people, right? So make sure you are doing your investigation before taking any action, then taking action and then coming back and realize, oh, I should have, so coming to know the things you should have known before you really engage with whoever, right? And within the uh, the job market for cybersecurity, there is a big scam that is also going on. Scammers have, so, like they've seen that, this is a really, you know, good market for this event. So they will they will portray that they are a recruiter and they will keep asking for your social security number and your your details. And they know people are easily going to give it away. And it's very like the irony is that you are a cybersecurity professional looking for or aspiring cybersecurity professional looking for a cybersecurity job and you are falling for a cybersecurity scam. Right. So they will get we have some some of our students. Hey, you know, the item for my social security number, no company is going to ask you that until they are they have given you an offer and you are doing onboarding. Right. Until then, and some people will even tell you, oh, we just gave you the job because we think like you're a perfect fit. So you're not even going to do an interview. Really? And you're also happy because you are very lucky. No, it doesn't work that way. Right. So anything that you think or in your in your honest opinion, you think this is BS, but it's too sweet. Don't look at the sweetness. Please do your research on it. So if they say they are a company that wants to employ you, blah, blah, blah they research into the company, right? Like I always tell everybody, when we did the job uh, placement, you know, uh, series, we talked about researching into the company, knowing more about the company than the person who is going to interview you uh, for the role you are looking for. Right. So dig into the company, research about them, Google them, look at their ratings, check their LinkedIn page, do all that. So if it is not a company, you will know. Uh, if it is a scam, you know. It, for Even for us, as cybersecurity companies, we do receive that. And I think for a while ago, for one of our uh, incident response or like our social engineering, uh, we use that as one of the case studies. So mostly we will receive, I think for a while, we will receive a, an email with a contract right sometimes it was i think one that we received was funny like a contract for us to supply laptops we don't sell laptops i mean we are in cyber security we don't do any of that but they will send that to you and we knew it was a phishing attack but we just followed up just to you know build and make a case study out of it so we we did our quote and we sent it to this person who was supposed to be working for i think the u.s courts 
right? We searched him on LinkedIn, nothing showed up. The US code address was okay, but the number on there was his, was some other number, not the US court's number. And the link they sent for you to input your quotes and everything, if you read like what they have there for, for like whatever they are looking for, it, it kind of looked funny. Uh, the logos look a bit scanned, right? And superimposed on that. So there are a lot of, you know, red flags, but if you get carried away and you think, oh yeah, you know, like they want us, if you're a new company, you think this is our first contract, it's gonna be good. Now they have it on there where, uh, if you send them the quote, so we send them the quote, they reached out back and said, oh, uh, so when can you supply these laptops? And we're like, so what, did we win the contract? Oh yeah, yeah, you, you, you won. Really, like, do you even know how the government uh, procurement process works? <laughs> we just won the contract by submitting, really? Yeah, yeah, you like you won if you can like supply them and supply them to this address and we'll pay you in 30 days. Like, oh, okay. So we ignore them, right? We didn't follow up. And then they called. We picked a call and we're like, okay, so what's the deal? Did we, yeah, yeah, we won. Can you supply? And then we started quizzing them and guess what they did? Oops. They just cut the core and, you know, uh, they they went the happy way because they knew we were not going to fall for that, right? But that is a big, and guess what? The email that they were using to send these, you know, it was a spoofed email with a .gov at the end of the email, right? Extension. But when you click on reply, it shows the actual email that is hiding behind the .gov. Right. But if you don't know all of these tricks and techniques, you are going to fall for it because you've been taught if it is .gov, it's an official government email. But they can spoof a .gov email too. right? So uh, I think all those are some of the things that we can talk about during uh, other cyber chats. But we are going to move on and wrap it up. right? All right, so now we will jump into incident response. What is incident response? And it's good we built you know, the background to this point. So everybody understand what an incident is and the magnitude of an incident. So we could have easily just gone straight with incident response, definitions of it and all that. But I think nobody on here is going to forget about incident response. And you're going to be thinking about this uh, for the longest time, right? And because you know Uber, you know what happened to them. It's going to be a discussion for you and your family, you know, in a significant other and breaking it down. And you are going to research even more into it. Learn about what is happening to this guy and what did he do prior to getting this? You know, so uh, this makes it very interesting and it makes it real. You see the real life application of this. So incident response, uh, it is a structured approach that we use to identify, manage, and mitigate security incidents or cybersecurity breaches, right? The background of incident response or the main goal is not to only respond to the incident after it has happened, but to prepare yourself. And then also to, as part of the preparation, we try to prevent or reduce uh, the chances of the occurrence of the incident. Right? So part of that preparation is awareness training, right? But like I said earlier, uh, uh, breaches or uh, incidents, they are bound to happen. <clears throat> it's just a matter of when. If your company has not experienced it, don't think you are the best thing that has ever happened. So uh, that is why it didn't happen. It is going to happen. That is why you should take a proactive approach of having an incident response program in place. Not just an incident response program on paper. That is just going to save you when you, know, you have to go to jail as company top management. But a natural incident response program that is being practiced, that works, right? So you should have an incident response team within your incident response program right now like i always say everything starts with what governance so incident response will start with governance as well so your your policies and your procedures and your incident response plan when exactly how you are going to execute your incident response within the company right and then you move into setting up your incident response team and the rest right so the goal is to make sure that if there is an incident the company is able to handle it smoothly right uh, in record time that way you know it doesn't become uh, a significant change in life events right so 
if a company has a very uh, dynamic, a very effective incident response team, when there is an incident, regardless of the magnitude, they are able to handle it well, and the company is able to recover easily from the incident. The public aspect of it, the legal aspect of it, all of it is handled really well, right? So it will, it will look as if the incident really uh, didn't cause that much damage to the organization. And of course, it's not going to cause that much damage. But an incident that is not even as that grave of a problem will become more than a, you know, like will cause like a grave damage if it is not handled well. So just imagine if we are all in a company, right? Uh, let's say maybe uh, 15 of us are working in the cyber security space, uh, five in the IT and the rest. And all, all of us, right? Let's say all of us are in there. Now there's an incident. We don't have any structured approach of managing an incident. And we just throw it to the public. Hey, uh, there's an incident. What are we supposed to do? Now, John is talking about, let's put out the fire first. Uh, Randall is talking about, no, let's call the fire department first. Uh, the other person is like, no, let's run away from the building. Right? Whilst you are doing that, guess what is happening? The fire is still burning. It is just moving through and destroying stuff. But if there is an, like a structured approach and everybody knows their role to play, it's just going to be like clockwork, right? Look at like the fire department. If they have a call that, hey, there's a fire, and now they are fighting between who is going to drive the truck and who is going to sit at the back. And no, I'm not sitting at the back today. You sat at the back last week. And who is going to turn on like the holes? No, it's, I'm not picking it. Guess what is going to happen? You, like your house will bend to the ground, right? But they've rehearsed how they handle incidents, how they go about it so well, they can all be sleeping. When there is, you know, like there is that uh, al like alert or that the, the alarm goes off, no question. Nobody asks or tells anybody anything. The driver knows what to do. This person knows. Everything is on point. And next, you know, in minutes or in like maybe five minutes, they're on their way. And when they get there, they know exactly everybody knows their role. That is how your incident response team should be. Or your incident response program should be on point, just like the fire department, right? So there are no arguments about who has to do what and none of that. So a company that is doing everything right, like I said, so for like Uber, if they had a very effective incident response program, the, like the chief security officer, uh, all that he had to do was they were going to report to him and say, this is, this is what happened. We've told the law enforcement, we've contacted the legal team. We've, all that would have been handled already. So that will even be out of his hand to shield it, right? But I don't think that was really the case. Well, it's time to be corrected, but it looks like it, right? So now let's move forward into how to actually handle incidents. Now there are six steps. The first step, preparation uh, is not really, preparation is part of the overall incident response program, but when it comes to actually handling it, uh, if you are preparing to handle it when the incident has occurred already, yeah, you are so going to pay permissions to an agent. Yeah. Uh, the agent must be unmute yourself. Okay, so you are you are totally wrong if you are planning to. Uh, you are now in the preparation phase when it happens, and right? you should be ready prepared. Uh, so the first stage and actually handling it will be the detection, identification, and detection stage. Then you go to analysis, you go to containment, you go to eradication, and you go to recovery. Right. And then you move on into lessons learned. Right. So this is just a brief of how identify or whether it's moving one attitude and the scope of it. And then you move into not allowing it to spread any further. And then you get rid of it. You eradicate it and then you try to bring the system and everything back to uh, how it used to be or to look like how it used to be. That way you can use it. Now we are going to look at why is incident response important? And I think everybody on here knows now, right? So we are just going to touch on briefly on why it is important. So it will help minimize the impacts of the damage. Like I said, if a house is burning and let's say the fire department is our incident response team, 
and they are there arguing about who has to do what, guess what is going to happen? What is the, how, what do you think is going to be the impact and the damage? It could have been a small fire, but by the time they get there, it would have totally destroyed the whole entire building, right? So if they have a very good incident response program in place, they are able to get there on time. So they're able to, you know, put out the fire in record time. So the damage is reduced. The impact will be also minimized, right? So two, reduce recovery time and the cost. So the bigger the impact, so if the whole house is totally uh, bent down by the fire, to recover your house back to its original state is going to cost you a lot of money, right? If it was just maybe part of the kitchen that was, you know, affected, it's easy. It's not going to cost us as much time to bring it back to the original state, right? And enhance security posture. So if we have a good incident response program in place as part of the preparation stage, we will make sure our security posture is strengthened, right? By putting in place, like we were discussing earlier, uh, levels of or uh, defense in depth strategies that will help us to remain uh, very active when it comes to our security posture. Now, legal and regulatory compliance. With an incident, so every company or all companies, depending on the industry that you find yourself in, uh, you have to abide by certain legal and regulatory compliance uh, requirements, right? So if you are in the health side, you have to stay in compliance with HIPAA. If you are in the educational side and you're on the government side, even I think outside the government side, you have to stay in compliance with FEPA. Uh, for if you're accepting credit card and debit card, uh, PCI DSS, right? If you work in the government, if you're a government agency or you're a contractor for the government, RMF and FESMA. Right? So there's a whole list of them, right? Now, incident response are part of all these frameworks that I just touched on. So within your company, do you have an incident response obligation to report uh, incidents that will happen to law enforcement and to the public, right? Uh, there is a natural law by state that will uh, let you know which state agencies you have to report the incidents to, right? So if Uber had a vibrant or an incident response team that was effective, there will be somebody on the incident response team who is responsible for legal and regulatory compliance. And those folks would have just, you know, uh, get with, or they would have just, you know, uh, contacted the appropriate state agency or federal agency, the state, the appropriate law enforcement uh, agencies and would have alerted them of this, right? Because they would have been already set up just like the fire department, how they move their tracks. So before you come in as the fire chief to tell them, hey, why this, they would have been gone. Everything is, you know, working. The system is working. So you don't need any input from anybody. And you can't tell them, well, I don't like the lady whose house is on fire. So please don't go. Everybody is staying here. That is not going to work. Because when there is an alert, they have everything put in place. Like before you can say, Jack, they're on their way. Over there putting out the fire. Right. So if that is how your incident response team should be, they shouldn't rely on the CISO or the chief of technology or the chief of security, they shouldn't rely on any of those people to function. So that goes to show you, I don't know what kind of, maybe Uber should pay me big money. I can help them with incident response. Right. So now we move into customer trust and brand reputation. You don't want to be in a case study like this, right? Or any case study for that matter for incidents that happen, right? So when customers, their trust uh, is gonna be a bit on the low side, right? And your your goodwill that you've built over the years is, you know, going to obviously tank and your stocks and the rest is going to be affected. Now, uh, this lessons learned from this will also prevent future incidents. You might think, right, what happened to Uber 2014 and the same vulnerability was exploited in 2016. So did they have a really like, were they having a really good incident response program in place? I don't think so. So intellectual property protection, yes, and also data protection uh, will all be some of the benefits and some of the reasons why we need to invest in incident response, right? So we are wrapping up 
uh, our new cyber security, our new PCI class is beginning on the 16th of October. Uh, everybody is invited to join and our career path. Uh, so for everybody, we have cyber security crash course. Uh, cyber security for beginners is a free course and PCI for beginners is also one of our PCI free courses. And for if you are looking to get into the cyber security space, uh, to learn cyber security, to become a cyber security, a dynamic and effective cyber security professional, then we encourage you to take our cyber security entry level course. Uh, that covers everything in terms of knowledge, uh, taking you through different aspects of cyber security like this one, uh, and then taking you through the hands-on training aspect. So even with the hands-on training, we expose you to the tools. And as part of that, we show you one trick of how to uh, really uh, do one you know, attack. Not It's not a full-blown pen testing class, but we show you how to do a very simple uh, attack. So doing something on the lines of uh, social engineering and how to create some of these links of duplicating a website like Facebook and sending a link to somebody to click on it to put in their username and password, which will all going to come to you, right? So you can even try that on your own. All that is part of, aside the other tools like Splunk and the rest that we're going to show you how to use and build your own lab. Uh, all that is part of the of the uh, cyber security awareness training. And then we have two months of internship that you are going to go through where we actually We'll work on projects like incident response for a company. Uh, we work on audits and the rest. So it's a full-blown program that is going to make you uh, a cyber security professional, all-rounded, ready to assume most of the security uh, jobs that are out there. Right. So when with a PCI, we are training you to be a PCI professional in one of the biggest niches within the cyber security space as well. Right. So uh, we have our standalone. Uh, cyber security internship also for everybody who's gone through different training if you want hands-on real world working with a company uh, that is also starting on the 21st so the saturday uh, after we've started the cyber the pci training right so you are invited to join all this also as well and mode of payments we have different installment payment options you can you know pay now learn now pay later with affirm and the rest uh zero down payment with meritize and you can do income sharing also with Maya Share and the rest. All of this is on our website, arithmetsacademy.com. Uh, so with that, we are going to wrap it up. But next week, we are still going to uh, touch more on incident response, focusing on individuals, how we'll be able to protect ourselves and our companies. And then we will look at some of the career paths uh, that we have within the incident response uh, field in security. Right? Any questions for the group? before i think there are some questions in the chat uh, olan no no olan uh uchiba please go ahead yeah um doc i just have one quick question like um why P pc i dss is very very important in compliance analysis job oh you're asking why it's important yeah, because I, 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 there was an interview I got like that, but they asked me if I have a training in PCF DSS. Oh, okay. So, so anyway, I was just I think thinking, see, you always talk about this in the class. Oh, okay. Sure. okay, so I think uh, maybe I'll have some of the PCI folks on here answer this. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone? I think I'm going to click on somebody. Uh, okay, so who thinks uh, or why is PCI important? Go ahead. Uh, it's it's pain. Oh, go ahead. I can say something about it. Um, any organization that does um, all the carry card information, either store, transmit, or process. Uh, for safety of the account holder based on certain uh, standard set up by the five major uh, financial company. Um, yes, you know, certain requirements. If you don't do those things and you get hacked, uh, you're going to be fined from range of depending on how much you process. I mean, it could be as low as 20,000 to a million, but it's going to be a huge fine. You're going to be responsible. So once you don't follow those requirements, majorly 12 of them, uh, you're going to be in trouble, you know, if you process this time. So that's why it's very important. They're asking you why you have that experience. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. So I think before I let Julius go, 
So we were talking about frameworks or standards that organization will have to follow, like they are legal and regulatory compliance uh, aspect of security, right? Now, when it comes to that aspect, legal and regulatory, uh, we have different standards or what we call frameworks. Uh, PCI DSS is one. So PCI DSS uh, affects or uh, for companies that have to stay in compliance with PCI DSS, if you, are, if you accept credit card and debit card as form of payments within your company, then you have to stay within PCI DSS uh, compliance you know, space. Now with the frameworks, different frameworks like RMF, uh, the rest, FESMA, HIPAA, and the rest, right? They are all frameworks that you have to stay in compliance with based on the industry you are in or what you do within security. Now, the, for you to really, you know, pick a path that you want to follow is this. Uh, you have to look at a framework that is international, a framework that applies to all industries, right? So with PCI, regardless whether you're a government agency, whether you are in Africa, whether you are in Europe, if you are accepting credit card and debit card, you have to follow PCI. If you don't, they will take away that capability of you being able to accept credit card and debit card, right? And uh, if you're a company who is not able to accept credit card and debit card, I don't know what kind of business you are going to be in uh, because people don't carry around cash. And plus, if I'm in Australia and I want to purchase something from your website, uh, maybe it's a digital product, uh, am I going to mail you my like the money or how are you going to get the money? Right. I mean, so uh, companies, they don't, and, and they are forced to follow this, right? Unlike other frameworks like ISO and the rest, which are nice to have if you follow, but the rest like HIPAA, HIPAA applies to only health industry within the US, right? Now within that same health industry, if they are accepting credit card and debit card, they have to follow PCI. So PCI cuts across is international and everybody needs it. Uh, almost all, all every company accepts credit card and debit card, so that is why uh, you need PCI, right? So you can work in in security uh, or within the, whichever industry. You probably wouldn't have to follow HIPAA. You probably wouldn't have to follow follow RMF or follow ISO or any of these. But if your company is accepting credit card and debit card, regardless of what level they might find themselves you know, level one to level four, they will have to follow, they will have to follow PCI uh, DSS standards. And so if the company during the interview, they were asking you for that, then probably uh, they they have to follow PCI DSS uh, standards. So they want somebody who will be able to help them on those lines. And there are a lot of companies who are blue when it comes to PCI DSS. And I know this because I work with most of these so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think Julius had something. Uh, and then we are going to wrap up. So thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm going to pass. You pretty much said what I was going to say, Dr. Du. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. So uh, uh, before we wrap up, just taking a glance. So if you had a question, uh, in the chat and we didn't address, you can please raise your virtual hand and let us know because there's a lot in here that I know we've been holding uh, everybody up for a while. So we have to wrap it up. Now, next week, we are going to continue. On, and as like I said, as part of the Cyber Security Awareness Month, we are doing some sponsorships. So we are do, we we're going to do eight, but we are doing 10 in total. And that will cut across our... Uh, ECI training, cyber security, when uh, cyber security entry level course, and then also intention, right? So our two winners for tonight, uh, we are picking two. Next week, we'll pick three. And then throughout the month of October, we are going to be picking more, right? And who knows, maybe sometimes we even pick more than uh, what we originally started with. So our two for tonight, uh, pick at random, uh, two folks that we picked at random tonight, uh, first one is uh, Ucheba. Hey. Ucheba. Uh, um, so Ucheba, uh, Udi, uh, Ud Odega. 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 Odega, thank you. Uh, so Ucheba Odega, uh, please shoot us an email and uh, they will take care of you. Then they'll let you know which program you are going to win. The next one is Abena uh, Odiko. Okay. 
So uh, Abena, if Abena is still on here, uh, Abena would go. You are also please also shoot us uh, uh, an email. Abena Diko. Abena, yes, yeah, Diko, not Odiko. Yay! Not Diko. <laughs> wow, wow, thank you. And God. they were all picked at random. So uh, next week, we are also going to give three like that. And it cuts across. So it was, and also for like your prize, it's going to be also random. You can receive PCI, uh, DSS training. Uh, so but the main point is you won and you are going to, you know, get something in terms of training, uh, good training in cybersecurity. So for uh, information about, our, we have a WhatsApp group. So for everybody who is not in our WhatsApp group, you can please join, uh, it's a big community and all information and good information that we are sharing, we are going to put it on there. Uh, it's a fairly quiet group. So you are not going to receive any spam and the rest. Uh, and we also have some, uh, cyber security police on there, they are going to whip you in line if you are posting it outside cyber security uh, also as well. So uh, please do well to join. And then also for our YouTube, we have a lot of these chats on YouTube, a very good place for you to get, you know, great knowledge into the cyber security uh, space. And if you need help with anything, uh, our details have been posted in the chat. So you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to help that grow, to help other uh, fellow uh, folks to also get to find us uh, on YouTube and also to learn. And uh, we are wrapping up. I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, we stayed a bit longer today because of the case study. It was interesting. We we're discussing next week. We're also going to have a case study as well. And congratulations to our winners, Abina and uh, Ucheba. Uh, and next week, we are going to pick three more winners. I appreciate everybody's time. We're wrapping up for tonight. I'm Dr. Emmanuel Ledoux. I know it's Friday night, but you know, you chose to be here with the family and we always uh, try to make sure that you you are going to go away with uh, something meaningful and also you are going to learn and add to your toolbox as a cybersecurity professional or aspiring cybersecurity professional. I appreciate everybody's time. For internship folks, we are meeting- Bye, today. Dr. Samuel, Emmanuel, bye. Yeah, bye. All right, so I appreciate everybody's time. Have a great weekend. We'll meet again next week, God willing, same time for cyber chat. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Congrats to the winners.